Hello and welcome to our August 8th online service. I'm Jackson Brotherton and I'm your host this morning. We have a great service plan for you, so without any more dilly-dallying, let's get right into it. Here are this week's announcements. Our summer day camp wrapped up a couple weeks ago and it went amazing. So amazing that we're doing it again! Woohoo! From August 16th to 20th, we'll be hosting an online day camp that is open to pretty much anyone with Wi-Fi. Everything you need will be delivered to you so your kids can have a day camp experience right from home. Registration is open now, so head over to sablerchurch.ca slash events to sign up and get your free day camp box delivered to you. If you weren't already aware, we're having a church service right now on the beach, all thanks to the Salt Beach Chamber of Commerce. If you're watching this, I'm assuming that you're probably not there right now, but if you're like me, I want to see how it went, so you can stay tuned to our social media to see some videos, some photos, and overall just see how it went. This week is Andy's last week here at our church, and we really are going to miss him, me specifically. I had a great connection with Andy, and I mean, he doesn't know I'm saying any of this, and I'm coming up with all of this on the spot, but we really are going to miss you, Andy. There's going to be a massive hole <laughs> in everything that you've done, and uh, with all the, everything you do for the videos, to worship, to youth, it's really going to miss you. And I want to send you off with a big virtual hug and uh, say it one more time. We will really miss you. But best of luck and God be with you as you start at a new church. That's all we have for announcements this morning. So now let's transition into a time of worship. Before we start worship, I ask that you join me in a short prayer. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, as we take some time for worship this morning, whether we're singing along or we're just sitting watching, God, will you pull us into a few minutes of complete focus on you? God, worship is about you. It's not about us. So we give this to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
This morning we are rewinding back to 2018 to listen to a sermon from a man who is very well spoken, very wise, and even has a really cool kid. We're going to hear from my dad, David Brotherton, but before we get into the sermon, let me read a bit of scripture from Matthew 5. If you open your Bibles to Matthew 5, and as you do that, let me pray really quick. Lord, open our eyes to your truth. and. As we dig into this teaching this morning, give us understanding and bring the change you want into our lives. So Matthew 5, verse 17 to 20 says this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, an iota and a dot will pass from the law until it all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Jackson, for reading that scripture for us. He's a good kid. But that last sentence, that last phrase in, in that passage he read, unless the righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you won't see the kingdom of God. How, how do we do that? The Pharisees' lives were completely built on strict legalistic obedience to the law. And Jesus is saying we have to surpass that, exceed that, if we expect to see his kingdom. How do we do that? That's in the Sermon of the Mount. And we're going to join a series actually this morning from 2018. A series on the Sermon on the Mount called The Upside Down Kingdom, which really was about how do we live in God's kingdom. And I hope what we see from this is that, that Jesus shows us his expectation of how we live a lifestyle with him as king, not tethered to the do's and don'ts and the legalism. And Jesus explains that to us. So we're going to go there today. So if you have a Bible, uh, go to Matthew chapter 5. That's the passage Jackson read for us. We're going to pick it up uh, after the part that he read, which started as verse 17. And we're going to jump into this sermon from 2018 part way through. And it was a really long sermon, so we've cut it down. You'll see that as you watch it. It's been edited um, to, to a reasonable amount of time without cutting out anything important. So... Uh, let's jump in now and join that sermon already in progress. How does Jesus expect us to live without being tethered to the legalistic do's and don'ts? 
Jesus does not come to abolish the law. He doesn't come to end it or destroy it or say we're, it's done and gone. But actually, he says Jesus comes, as in this passage says, to fulfill the law, to, to bring life to it, to bring it to its fullness. As Jesus comes to take us to a higher ground than simply the legalistic law. The law stands. The Judaizers and Islam depend on the law because your obedience to the law is what redeems you in God's eyes. That's what makes you right with God. So your level of obedience puts you into right standing with God. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus disconnected the the legalistic obedience to the law from, from redemption. It's not the obedience of the law and the do's and don'ts that saves you. It's Jesus. And instead of, here's the moral code, you must live this way to please God. Because of Jesus. We please God. And as a result, I obey the moral code. Completely turning it upside down. And Jesus goes on in this passage we're going to look at today and looks at six examples of how the moral code says this, but Jesus says this. And we're going to look at that. In that day, the Pharisees had huge issue with Jesus about this because their perspective of Jesus was that he's completely destroying the law of Moses, that moral code. He's ripping apart, he's ignoring it, he's not living by it. And this was everything the Pharisees lived their lives on. Everything stood on that. So if Jesus is ripping it apart, he's killing them and their way and what they've established. Jesus goes on to talk about that straight on. He addresses this in, in, this in this whole sermon, chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, where he's talking about life in the kingdom of God. Now, if you've been traveling with us the last couple of weeks, we've defined the kingdom of God this way. And I think this comes from the Sermon on the Mount, that the kingdom of God is those people who live as if God is king. That right here, right now, today, Jesus is king of me. And if I live that way, that is the kingdom of God. That starts now and goes through eternity. It's not a future thing or place. It's these people today. So if you have a Bible, I hope you do. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus knows what the Pharisees are thinking here. And he goes straight at it. He says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. Verse 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass away, pass from the law until it is accomplished. So here's Jesus. He's got these Pharisees right in the very front. And he says, I didn't come to destroy the law. He's talking to them. As a matter of fact, not even the smallest detail of the smallest punctuation mark will be removed. And they're starting to lean in. And he goes on and he says, if you keep the law and you teach the law, you're the highest in the kingdom of heaven. What's happening in their mind? Okay, this is good. We're leaning in. And then Jesus, boom, pulls the carpet out from underneath them because what he says is, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Picture this. The the Pharisees spent their entire lives on the law. Every little bit, as thoroughly and as deep. They were the highest regarded. They were the perfect ones. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness, unless the way you live... Does it exceeds them? That's impossible. How do we do that? How in the world do we do that? But Jesus says here, he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. What is the law? What, we have to know the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law, as we read the rest of the New Testament, the purpose of the law is to show us ourselves. 
It shows us we can't do it. It shows us this is impossible. It shows us where we're imperfect. It shows us where we need to be rescued. Like when I look in a mirror and I see that my face has dirt all over it, the mirror shows me my, my stuff. You understand that? But in order to get clean, I don't rub my face on the mirror to get the dirt off. That's the perspective of the Pharisees. It's the law that cleans me. Jesus is saying the law shows you you need to be cleaned. Okay, see the twist? This is Jesus' upside-down kingdom. Actually, Galatians chapter 3. You don't need to turn there uh, for the sake of time. Now, before faith came, we were held captive by the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian. Another translation will say tutor. The King James says schoolmaster. The law was our schoolmaster, our tutor, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now, faith has come. We no longer need the tutor. We live without it. Does that make sense? The law, all this law is not done and gone, but it was our tutor to show us we need Jesus. And now that we don't need the tutor anymore, because we got Jesus. Before we dig into six examples that Jesus gives us, let me put this picture in your head. We've all been in Niagara Falls, I assume. And at Niagara Falls, if you're walking along the sidewalk right beside the river, uh, there is a big railing, stone with metal rails. Okay? How many of you have actually climbed over that to take a picture? Don't tell me I'm the only one. Come on. <laughs> Why is that railing there? It's to keep us from falling in, right? Falling over. The railing is there to protect us on the edge of disaster. I've been, I've been in England and I went to the White Cliffs of Dover. And um, as we approached that, there was, we're on his path, and then there was this massive fence that says, do not go beyond this, right? The ground is unstable, and there's danger. The weird thing is, is past this massive fence and sign, the path keeps going. So we jump over the fence, and we start walking towards, on, we're on the path, and we're going. When you actually get to the edge of the cliffs, there, there's a little fence there. Why is the fence there? Because if we've actually crossed the line before and stayed on the path all the way to the edge, this is to keep us to actually from killing ourselves. Okay, I want you to have that picture in your mind. And this picture it, uh, is going to come back after every, every point I make this morning, after every example of Jesus gives us we look at, this is going to pop up back to remind you of that. Okay, So get that picture stuck in your mind. Okay, let's go to verse 21. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be, will be liable to the, the fires of hell. You've heard it was said, do not murder. That is a direct quote from the law. Like a line in the sand. Do not cross this line. Do not murder. But what about everything else that leads up to murder? Okay, go back to the, 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 the fence and the, and the fence and the pathway. What the, what the uh, Pharisees would do was say, the line of sin is murder. But if I, as long as I don't cross that line, I could undercut, I could wreck your life, I could hate, I could spread rumors, I could do all of this as long as I don't cross the line. What about the path that actually leads to murder? This is what Jesus is getting at. The same sin that would cause us to kill somebody starts way before that. 
It's not just about keeping us in line from doing bad. But what Jesus is teaching is, isn't just about not doing bad, it's about inspiring us to do good. The attitude Jesus teaches here fixes relationships, not helps us to run from them. It's radical. What Jesus is saying is actually run from the line of sin. Run the other way. It's not just the one who murders. Jesus said it's the one who harbors anger in their heart. Now that gets expressed all kinds of different ways. He uses the example when you call somebody, uh, you fool. That, that word in, in Greek is raka and actually means moron. Okay, how many when you're driving? I don't even need to say the illustration. Do you? you know what I mean. What comes out our mouth? You moron. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. What does that in our heart is crossing that first gate that says do not enter and I'm on the path towards murder. Now I'm never going that far, right? You're never going that far. But what Jesus is saying clearly here is the sin of murder is exactly the same as the sin that comes out my mouth that says you moron because it's the heart it's in the head. It's exactly the same sin. 1 John chapter 4 says, You say you love the Lord, but you have anger or bitterness in your heart? You're a liar. Those are strong words. Any harbored hatred or bitterness or anger to anyone in your heart, it's the same sin Jesus is saying as murder. In a sense, here's what Jesus is saying. You've heard it's okay to go right up to the line. I'm saying, don't even get on the path. Keep off the path that leads to the fence that protects you from falling. So does Jesus downgrade the law? No. He takes us to a whole new level. Look at the next one, verse 27 talking about sex in relationships. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in her heart. You see the same thing here? Jesus says, you've heard this. And yes, the law says do not commit adultery. But the law has so, much, so many more words in there that what they've done is they've peeled this part out, made this the law, and everything that leads up to it is okay as long as I don't cross the line of adultery. Same point. The fence is to keep us from falling off, but don't even get on the path. The line the Pharisees focused on was the adultery. The path that Jesus describes is lust. The thinking about and harboring and stirring and causing energy, the heart part of this is jumping the fence and getting on the path. Jesus is saying it's not about the line of adultery, but the path way back here is the longing to have, the stirring in my mind like that anger, the holding on to wanting something that's not mine. That's where the line, and if, if that is not not an issue in my life, then the line of adultery disappears. That's what Jesus is getting at. He, he continues on, he says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of the members of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to lose one of your members than to throw your whole body into hell. Hyperbole. Here's why I know this is a hyperbole. Because if we are going to spend sexual energy on anything or anybody that's not my wife or husband, that's adultery. Jesus is saying way before that is the lust. But you know what? If I pluck my eye out or cut my hand off, I can still lust. How I act on it might be different. So it's a hyperbole. Jesus is saying, go to extreme lengths 
to get this out of your head and out of your heart. Not this, this. Back at the first fence. Do everything, take drastic measure to get that out of your heart. Don't miss the strength of what he's saying. The path will destroy you long before the adultery happens. Am I just seeing how close to the edge I can get? Or am I trying to live the way God wants me to? Divorce is the next one. He's really still on the same topic, but he says in verse 31, It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he's still talking about adultery. But there's something else going on here. You've heard that it's been said that if you're going to divorce, you have to give a a, a certificate. Get it in writing, do it legally, he says. Here's what happened. The Pharisees took this approach to the law. Here's an example from the New Testament that that I think we'll understand. In Matthew chapter 5, um, verse 38, Jesus says, If someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. Here's what the Pharisees would do. Well, that means it's okay to strike someone. Because it says, if someone strikes you, well, that's assumed striking is going to happen. Okay? Did you you see that weird logic? Rewind to the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 24, where we have this whole passage about divorce, where they get this law from. And that says, if this, 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 then give a certificate of divorce. What did the Pharisees jump all over? They scrapped all the ifs. And what they were actually teaching in that day was, it doesn't matter what the reason is. You could divorce for any reason if you've fallen out of love as long as you give a certificate of divorce. What's Jesus say? You've heard, it's been said, give a certificate. But I say, way back before that, Okay, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus uh, is talking and the Pharisees come up to him and say, same issue exactly, and in, that, in this chapter 19 of Matthew, the Pharisees come up and say, so is it lawful to divorce for any cause? This is what they've been teaching. Then why did Moses say give a certificate of divorce? Jesus must just be going... How many times do I have to go through this? And he points out there that you guys mess with Scripture. You guys mess with Scripture and it's not okay. Moses allowed it, says there in verse 7, because you screwed it up so much. Jesus says, I say it's the same statement. Deal with the first fence, not the second fence. Oaths. Oaths is simple here. Our our scripture says uh, here, do not make an oath and swear by this or by this or by this. And it lists a whole bunch of things. If you go to, there's another passage too in Matthew chapter 23 that also says, do not swear by this or by this or by this or by this, right? So here's what they did. Oaths are normal and common. And all the way through scripture, God even makes oaths. It's not the oaths that are the problem. It's the swearing by, and here's why. Uh, how many of you, especially when you're a kids, you cross your fingers and you make a statement, what does that do? It means what I said doesn't matter, right? The Pharisees did exactly that. They actually had an elaborate system of oaths. That if I, I swore an oath on this, these rules apply. If I swore an oath on this, these rules apply. If I swore an oath on this, these... So if I said I swear an oath on this beautiful mug then these, what it did in all this intricacy of laws, it, it rendered their word meaningless. Because they could get a loophole no matter what. So I could say whatever I want to you, and it doesn't matter. I got my fingers crossed. What is Jesus saying? You've heard, but I say, don't swear by anything. Jesus doesn't say here, don't make oaths. He says, don't swear by, let your yes be yes, your no by you. Above all, the point Jesus is making is, here's the line, don't swear by stuff. 
back here the line is, honor your word, live in a way that your word means something. Going to make a promise? Live your life in such a way that your word means something. Let me do the last two together. Verse uh, 38. You've heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say do not resist the one who is evil. But if someone slaps you on the right cheek, cheek, turn to him the other. If anyone would sue you for your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard it's been said, you love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And he continues on in that train of thought. If you live on earth, you will have friends and you will have enemies. If you live on earth, you will have people who hurt you and you will have people who love you. The Pharisees had taught... It's to love the people who love you. It's easy to love those ones. It's hard to love the people that mistreat us. And this is what Jesus is talking about. People who smack you on the face, who give you insults. Think about the living there with the Roman guards watching over everything. How how much they hated foreigners. The Pharisees, Pharisees emphasize part of the law. An eye for an eye. Correct. That's what the Bible says. But if we look in those passages in Deuteronomy 19 and Exodus 21, they're talking to judges in the court. The way you determine a sentence is an eye for an eye. But what Jesus is saying is you never take personal vengeance. Never take it into your own hands. Leave that to him. And if something has to be done, you go to court and the judge will deal with it. That was their Old Testament law. The Pharisees were teaching an eye for an eye, so if you do something to me, you get it right back. You've heard the phrase, I don't get mad, I get even. There is not a free phrase anywhere that is more opposed to the life of Jesus than that phrase. That's what this part is talking about. They saw justification for vengeance. When it said eye for an eye, that gave us justification for vengeance. So I can go as close to the line as I possibly want. What's Jesus saying? Back up the truck to the fence that was back here with the sign on it. Don't even get on the path that's going to lead to that. The law of Moses actually demands that we treat enemies fairly. Okay, let me go back to where we started. For the last couple of weeks, we've been in this series on the Sermon on the Mount. And the kingdom of God are the people who are living with Christ as king now. Jesus is calling you and I to live his way. Don't even get on the path that leads to the fence that's supposed to help you. If we live the way Jesus is saying here, who cares where the line is? I don't even need to know what that line is because I'm never going to see the line of murder because I'm not even going to ever harbor bitterness in my heart. I'm never going to see the line of adultery. Adultery doesn't even matter if it's right or wrong because I'm never even getting get on the path of looking and longing. I'm never going to, I don't need to know what the law is about swearing by this or swearing by this or swearing on my mother's grave or anything. I don't even need to know that because I'm coming way back here and saying my word is my word and I live that way. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He did not come to abolish the law. He came to call his people way beyond the law to live in a way that honors God. It isn't about do's and don'ts. Do's and don'ts are critical. But do's and don'ts don't make us right with God. Because Jesus makes us right with God, the do's and don'ts are a response to live in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, I put up a gate three miles back. Why are you falling over the edge? These three banners... As we look at this scripture and say, what do I do about this? I want us to go back to this. Every time you read scripture, every time you're in your life group, 
Every time we're in a conversation about what Jesus says, go back here. And, and let me, I, I, won't, I won't get into it here, but think about this. What have we just learned about God, about God's kingdom, about the way that God wants us to live, his expectations for us, what is, about our life as a follower of Jesus? What have we just learned about that? That's the knowledge part. Then become like Jesus. Let's do that. Let's live that. The, fa- the final verse, I close my Bible. The final verse in this chapter says, then don't be like them. Be like your Father in heaven who is perfect. Become. That will change your world. It will change the world as you interact with people around you. It will change how you see your world. This is the simplicity of our vision. Let's go back to that all the time. I've got changing to do. How about you? Let's live as kingdom citizens. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and not follow Jesus. Ever since the first time I heard this series, the the image of the two fences really stuck with me. One fence right in the edge, keeping us from disaster. And the other fence way back, just stopping you from even getting on the path that could lead to danger. But all of this is way more than just do's and don'ts. It's a whole new way of living, living in God's kingdom. And if I'm living in God's kingdom with Jesus as my king, things are gonna look a lot different. Like Pastor Dave said, this is only part three in the whole series. And the whole series is available to watch on our YouTube channel. A few months ago, I myself went and watched it again, and it really is worth watching. It even can lead to great conversations with friends about this whole new way of living. Choose to live with Jesus as King. Let that stick with you this morning. But that's it for today. May God bless you, keep you, and empower you to live for Him. May God be with you. Thank you for joining us today. See you next week. You can tell I'm not tired this week. <laughs> Bobblehead. Bo- 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 I don't know things. No, you man. No, it's uh, yeah, too. Well, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Ooh, that's it. Well, there you go. Round of applause, round of applause. Thank you.